So th this morning we heard some fantastic stories about um, mixed farming operations and the, we heard a lot about the decisions that, that people are making in their mixed farming operations, um, how they come to those decisions, um, a lot about planning and I thought that was one of the common threads that ran through this morning's presentation was the focus on, on careful planning. Um, the purpose of this afternoon session is to, I guess, discuss the financial implications of the decisions and investments that you make, as well as the risks associated with those decisions and investments. The, the team that we've put together this afternoon is going to introduce you to a, a number of tools and techniques to, to help you with the, the financial considerations and complexity of mixed farming. Um, that team comprises Dr Jason Crean, um, Associate Professor Bill Malcolm and Dr Carl Barent. Jason Crean is a principal economist with New South Wales Trade and Investment based in Orange. Jason has 20 years experience as an agricultural economist working in extension, research and policy positions. He currently oversees economic research in primary industries with a focus on climate risk, mitigation and R&D evaluation. Bill Malcolm is Associate Professor at the School of Agriculture and Food Systems, University of Melbourne, and is teaching farm economics and works in farm systems research with Victorian DPI. Carl Berend is Lecturer in Agribusiness at the School of Agricultural and Wine Sciences. They're a little bit more focused in their um, food area at CSU on wine, um, at the Charles Sturt University Wagga. And he was formerly a consultant working across New South Wales, um, but is now teaching agribusiness management and planning at Wagga, both Wagga and Orange campuses of CSU. So to kick things off today, I would like to introduce you to Jason Crean. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Alex, for that. Uh, sorry, I seem to be lecturing up high from here and uh, sort of like feel like I'm delivering a sermon and it's definitely not going to be that. And I think this morning we had some uh, some great stories that the real people, the real farmers that have told. And I guess my presentation is more about what some of the trends are doing uh, in agriculture. Um, so some of the key trends we want to look at is changes in output changes in productivity and also changes in prices, just to give you that sort of general overview of, of trends in agriculture. Uh, I'll highlight some of the challenges in agriculture production, then look at the performance of some of those, some of the different uh, crop and livestock industries, and then a few uh, considerations, I guess, in thinking about mixed farming systems. Uh, so the first one I want to talk about was just uh, anywhere else, this would be a, just a fantastic story of success. Uh, you basically, in agriculture, you've had this amazing output growth. Uh, you know, going back um, from the 1960s, output's gone up by about two and a half times. Um, obviously, it's uh, volatile, but even when you take into account, you know, the effects of drought that we've had, so you can see the drought periods there where production's come back. It's still a you know a really solid trend in output growth, and you know most industri most industries would be pleased to have that sort of record. So I've had really strong historical product, historically strong output growth. Uh, that output growth has actually come along with, with uh, much fewer but larger farms. So you can see there that we've had a uh, trend towards uh, a lower number of farms. So you know, going from uh, 3,400 up there down to 100, sorry, 2,400 there, 3,400 to 130. So you've had a you know, 20, 20 or 25 per cent reduction in, in uh, the number of farms. Uh, you've also had a, uh, obviously a large increase in, in farm size over that period as well. So that's been a, a trend in Australian agriculture and it's largely because our labour's dear in Australia and, and capital is relatively cheap and so you've had a lot of substitution uh, between that. People substituting labour for capital has been one of the, been one of the responses. I've got a phone the technology. Oh, there we go. Okay, so one of the uh, sources of that amazing output growth has been uh, the productivity growth that's underpinned agriculture. So what do we mean by productivity? This is basically the, the efficiency by which we convert inputs, resources, uh, into outputs. Uh, and that's a chief component of our agricultural output growth. 
Uh, there's a quote there uh, from Paul Krugman who once remarked, productivity isn't everything, but in the long run it's almost everything. Um, and further, a country's ability to improve its standard of living over, over time depends almost entirely on its ability to raise its output per worker. So productivity is important right across the economy. It's been particularly important in our culture. Uh, that graph there just shows you what, what our uh, uh, output would have been uh, in the absence of that productivity growth. Uh, so that accounts about the productivity we achieved from, those from about 1950 that we can actually account for about 70% of that relates to productivity growth. So it's been a, been a tremendous success story. Uh, traditionally, I guess, product, we looked at productivity growth as a way of actually compensating us for uh, this decline in terms of trade. So decline in terms of trade when our, our price is received and not keeping up with our prices paid. Uh, so that's declined over the longer term and we've really relied on that productivity growth to actually bridge that, to bridge the difference and to keep people profitable. I just want to talk a little bit more about uh, the terms of trade. So these are just some, just some price series. So we've had obviously strong growth in crop prices. Uh, in the red there is canola, in the, in the blue is wheat. Uh, you start to fit some regression lines to that and you get some nice, nice positive price trends going back to the 1970s. And particularly, uh, I guess, when you look from uh, the sort of mid-90s or early 90s, you're actually getting some really strong uh, increase in commodity prices. It's a pity that rainfall didn't have the similar sort of trend and we'd be really, really laughing. Uh, but, but just sort of, I guess it reinforces that really it has been a really strong uh, increase in crop prices and that's obviously one of the reasons as to why We've had a large expansion uh, in cropping in Australia and particularly in New South Wales. Uh, if we look at things like uh, wool, um, after that collapse of the reserve price scheme, we came back a long way, but then since then it's been up and down a little bit, but there's a positive price trend for wool there as well. Uh, that's the eastern market indicator over that period of 73, 74 to 2009, 10. Uh, so when you you look at those and let's just have a look at the prices received and paid in a bit more detail. Uh, you can see from then up until about uh, the early 90s, uh, over this sort of period, our, our prices, uh, prices received were actually coming down, our prices paid were going up and hence our terms of trade was being badly affected. But since you know, those early 90s, you know, sort of through to now, we've actually really really started to plateau out, which, which to some extent, I guess, you know, it's a great, it's a good news story there. Uh, if we can maintain some of the productivity growth, it be, even becomes a better story. So that's a, a really positive picture, uh, our terms of trade actually levelling out over a reasonable period of time now. So that's uh, one of the reasons why I think probably a lot of people are positive about agriculture now. Okay, so some of the challenges for agriculture. So all those productivity trends I looked at was just up to 2003-04. Uh, more recently, there's been a lot of concerns, and you would have seen the media, uh, basically right across the economy, but, but also for agriculture, is uh, a decline in our rate of productivity growth. Uh, there's a lot of debate about that now as to whether um, that slowing in productivity growth, is it related to the amount we're putting in R&D? Um, you know, when's, what's the next green revolution going to be? What's the next major change that's actually going to continue to boost productivity? Uh, so the more recent numbers, when you look at those from Maybear, uh, we had output growth of 0.4% across the sector and reduced input use of 0.8%. So that gave us the 1.2% uh, uh, improvement in productivity. This uh, slowing in productivity is, productivity growth is not just an Australian phenomenon, it's basically right across uh, major developed uh, economies. So across those other agricultural sectors that's happening as well. Um, one of the major challenges is, is obviously competition for labour and we heard a little bit about that. Competition for labour, land and also water resources and, and part of that's driven by a really strong demand for mining. Uh, the third one there is about one of the uh, I guess one of the significant, well could be a significant implication is arises around climate change but when you think about it, climate change, you've already got the challenge of natural climate variability and that's probably why that really most of us will actually feel climate change is really just in that sort of, uh, more of the same, I guess, in terms of climate variability. But that's, uh, that's a, 
a fairly significant issue uh, for Australian producers is to continue to manage that climate variability well. Uh, just going to have a look now at how different industries have gone, and these are the ABARE classifications on different farm types. Uh, so we've got wheat and other crops industries, wheat, wheat and other crops industry, and that represents those more specialised producers of cereal grains, coarse grains, pulses, mixed livestock and, and cropping, uh, the sheep industry, the beef industry, then the sheep beef industry. All those classifications just relate to how much revenue is derived by each of those uh, particular classifications. So even when that, that first one of wheat and other crops industry, that particular farm type, if you like, also has livestock, it just means that wheat and other crops tends to dominate its total revenue. Uh, so when you look at, quickly look at the productivity, uh, so in the cropping industries, it's averaged 1.6% um, uh, over the last 20 odd years. Some of the ways that cropping industries have improved productivity is things like new technologies and management practices. Some of the, uh, the more recent period that's obviously been affected by drought, uh, but ABA have made allowances for that and you still actually have a decline in productivity growth, um, you know, even when you remove those effects of drought. Um, some of those, uh, one of the concerns I guess is maybe some of the, uh, with, on, the on the drought side, some of those high yielding crop varieties we might have had in the 1980s and 1990s really fell over when we actually had that run of really incredibly dry years in the early 2000s. Uh, the livestock industry's productivity growth in beef of 1.4%, in sheep it's been 0.5%. Uh, some of those productivity improvements relate to things like genetic improvement pasture, improving, improved pastures, uh, and also some changes in the composition of the sheep flock, uh, more towards uh, sort of prime land production. Um, it's been um, one of the, uh, and I guess it's always been a question because it's been a trend for so long, is productivity growth in the cropping industries has all, always seemed to have actually outstripped that in the livestock industries. Uh, but the reasons for that are not all that well understood. We can um, I guess theorise about maybe there's few opportunities in, in livestock industries to really substitute labour for capital. So you can't get the big new tractor and, and increase the size, the size of your operation. So there's few opportunities there uh, to do that uh, relative to cropping. Uh, there's longer production cycles obviously involved in breeding. Uh, and maybe some of the advantages are less observable in livestock than they are in cropping. Uh, these are only possible reasons as to why we've had this long-term difference between, between uh, cropping and livestock. But the more recent analyses from ABEAR suggest that that gap has actually narrowed quite a bit. Uh, so you can see the productivity numbers there. You know, cropping you know, has outperformed the other sectors, uh, even sort of mixed, you know, really mixed farms and beef and sheep. But that, that advantage, when you look at it, has actually started to, to fall away. Uh, it's positive, you know, I think it's positive on the, on the sheep side is this has actually started to turn around a little bit. So some positive news there and, and maybe people are finding some ways now to try to improve the labour productivity and, and doing things better. But it's, uh, it's always been a, a, a hard one to understand. Okay, so... Um, oh, sorry about that. Okay, so this is uh, just looking at uh, how those different industry classifications have gone over time. So you see the incredibly variable series. Um, the wheat and other crops uh, sector has actually seems to have outperformed the other ones. Um, and when you, so all the series are variable, but I guess some of the other ones involving livestock have been sort of less variable, but it's been off a lower base. So I've had much bigger swings, I guess, in the in the cropping area, and I guess that's not sort of surprising. When you look at it in terms of mean and standard deviations, so standard deviation being an indicator of variability, so New South Wales wheat and other crops, uh, that stands out in terms of, and this is over that period of 1990 to 2010-11, uh, higher mean incomes, uh, quite a bit of variability, so high variability in terms of standard deviations. Uh, and the other industries, uh, less variable in terms of standard deviations, but also less profit. Okay, so some of the key issues quickly for uh, uh, mixed farming systems. So obviously managing risk is, is a large one. Um, 
the mixed livestock and cropping industry had lower, lower profit levels, but also less variability. And the general theory is that as you, you know, farms which have more activities are going to have more exposure to more commodity markets and, uh, and that will, you know, to some extent stabilise incomes. So even if the correlations, we, we economists basically look for correlations in prices. So what you want to see is negative correlations, which is ideal, but even a correlation below plus one indicates that you'll actually have a more sort of even revenue stream if you've got more commodities you're relying on rather than one. I had a look at just some of the price correlations over the last sort of 20 years, and uh, they're reported in that table. So correlation is the extent to which one variable increases, what, what the, other, the other variable tends to increase. So if everything if it's plus one, everything's basically moving in exactly in the same direction and in the same proportion. So when you look at the uh, numbers, relationship between ASW wheat and feed wheat, Obviously, these are all cereals, high degrees of correlation. So strong wheat prices also is going to have effects on stronger barley and oat prices. Canola, obviously less so, so it's giving you some advantage. You've had exposure to canola. Uh, wool, uh, you're getting, the closer you are, you get to zero, it means there's no correlation at all. So you sort of expect that. And there's still some positive correlations with, uh, with lamb and beef. It's not causation here, we're talking about it's just correlation. Um, the other thing I looked at quickly, because uh, the OECD looked at this, was really about correlations between uh, major crop production and crop price. Uh, now we'd like to be, you know, it'd be great if, uh, if as, as, as wheat uh, yield um, uh, declined, price is actually rose by the same amount. You don't have that, but you end up, there is a, at least it's not, it's not strongly positively correlated, it's almost sort of no relationship. Now, I know in drought years, sometimes we actually do have high, high wheat prices, but a lot of that's been triggered by domestic demand, I think, rather than overseas demand. And, and by and large, our, our, our prices are really set on overseas markets. Um, but I guess how important is this issue of risk? So what, you know, when you go back to some of the earlier studies, and there's not too many of these, but it seems like that uh, most farmers actually have, have relatively low levels of risk aversion. You know, not much different to what people in society more generally would have. Uh, and that's not surprising, I guess, to me. If, if farmers were usually risk averse, then farm, farming would seem to be a fairly unusual choice to make about what you do with your life. Um, not saying you're not risk averse at all, but if you're you know, hugely risk averse, it doesn't sort of seem to play well with variable com commodity prices and variable production. Um, some of the economic modelling studies that have been done using uh, sort of linear programming models suggest that in terms of those decisions from one year to the next, that increase in the level of risk aversion doesn't seem to change the optimal sort of farm plan, if you like. So you're not actually getting much change by introducing uh, risk aversion into a model. Uh, so against that, though, that's just for those, some of those annual decisions. If you're talking about the bigger decisions about land purchase or a significant change in operation, then sure, you know, risk is important and you'd be fool not to actually uh, take heed of it. Um, but there are some, uh, usually it's, risk is put up as a reason as to why farmers diversify. And, and that's surely that's part of it, but uh, sometimes it can just reflect there are different resource constraints at key times and you can actually manage those resource constraints. By, um, by having different activities. Uh, also, sometimes diversification just reflect the level of variability you have in your farm resources. So, you know, for land, it's arability and soil type, um, things like that, that require different activities. You have different activities to exploit those different resources. And of course, you've also got these complementary uh, relationships in production. Um, so you've got nit nitrogen and fixation from pastures leading into cropping you got sheep for weed control. So there's some reasons as to why, even if you are totally unconcerned by risk, as to why some level of diversification might make a fair bit of sense. Uh, there's a bit of discussion about uh, complexity versus simplicity, and when you look at some of the papers that have been written, you know, mixed farming systems are continually sort of written up as a, you know, an extremely complex system. So there's one from McGuckian. A complex and require a high level of skill to run profitably. Um, another one from Price and Good research showed that making decisions for a mixed farm is a complex and demanding process. 
Uh, crop livestock integration in Australia has benefits but also challenges. So that's probably not of any sort of great supplier, great surprise to a lot of, I guess, a lot of you. But even with those complexities, farmers tend to do a, a good job of managing that complexity because that's reflected in a really strong productivity growth rates we've had actually over a long period of time. Um, so in terms of issues, you know, one is obviously about specialisation versus, versus flexibility. So specialisation, obviously you're, you're risking the possibility of foregone profits uh, further down the track if you specialise so much that you've got no ability to adapt to either changing seasonal conditions or changing market conditions. Um, flexibility, uh, you obviously, you're staying to get a, you're not capturing some of the efficiencies with, a, with that specialisation, but you've got some, uh, some ability to cope. Um, I guess in most production systems, you think that you might want to go a particular direction, but there might be some magnitude of change around that sort of strategy. So you're not totally, you know, if, if commodity prices have this large increase like we've had there with wheat prices over an extended period of time, you want to be able to be in a position to be able to tap into at least some of that rather than, say, stay focus on your livestock. Um, and in terms of that, uh, there's a quote there from, a, a famous quote from Keynes saying, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? So there's good reasons, I guess, to uh, you keep monitoring the environment and responding, responding to it to the extent that your sort of business allows you to actually do that without making too many compromises. Um, just uh, on also just on the complexity side, um, there's a bit of uh, quite a bit of work that's been done on adoption of innovations, and obviously, more complex innovations create adoption challenges. Um, complexity in different farming systems also creates challenges for researchers uh, and farmers alike. Um, another quote from Panel, who's also brought up this issue if, issue of complexity and the difficulty of trying to tease out bits of the system. So some quick conclusions. Um, you know, mixed farmers like agriculture more generally you know, operate in a market conditions that are exposed to the vagaries of, of uh, supply and demand and also policies from other governments. Uh, the natural environment we have in Australia is obviously significantly variable, so that creates a challenge. Um, in terms of farms' own resources, um, you know, one of the challenges is that a lot of family-operated farms, you've you know, so at some stage, your, what you do is going to be really conditioned upon, you know, what's happening with the family in terms of people's decisions to stay on the farm or go or, or etc. So I grew up on a mixed livestock farm and it, it was unusual that all the shearing always seemed to tend to actually occur during school holidays or university holidays. Um, so it was all about ma managing, that, that, managing that family labour. So it's difficult. Um, but as I say, a large part of agriculture is based on mixed farming systems and the people, that, the, I guess what you as farmers are doing, when you look at the raw numbers and go back and have a look at productivity, you know, that seems to be working because you wouldn't achieve really high rates of productivity growth, which is an ability to basically generate more output from a given, given set of inputs um, as well as you have unless you could actually deal with some of that complexity and uncertainty. Um, I guess the main, you know, economists look at this is what, what can you do from your available set of resources? So sometimes it's good to look over the neighbour's fence and you see how they're doing things, and that's all good, but at the end of the day, if your resource is a bit different, you've got to basically manage for your resources um, and what you're trying to do with your, with your business. So um, I was going to leave it there and um, hand back to Russell. Thanks. <laughs>